day. Um, so yeah, I want to give you just a few tips on presenting results. Um, try to make the figures that you're you're trying to present some result in some paper, including your papers. Uh, make the figure central to the to the slide. You don't have like three little figures with a bunch of text next to them. One slide per one figure, make it central. And always when you're describing any kinds of results, first say, this is what we are seeing on x-axis, this is what you're seeing on y-axis, or if you're presenting a table, this is what each row and column means. First, tell that to your audience, and then say what you're seeing on the plot. Tell, verbalize the observations, and make sure you tell us what the takeaway from those observations are. So try to follow this procedure. If you skip this first step very often, your audience is like, oh, what am I looking for? And you are talking about takeaways and they didn't even hear what your takeaways are. So strongly recommend to present your results um, in this way. Um, in terms of announcements, um, yeah, tomorrow is uh, the second uh, assignment is due. Do you, if you didn't get your hugging face uh, access to Llama 2, so you submitted everything to Meta, but you still didn't don't see that the hugging face is giving you access, send me a message on Piazza right away and I will give you some instructions. Um, I also want to uh, mention that, um, in, you know, um, a few of you asked me about how to go about prompts. Open these links that I have shared in the in the assignment itself. And I recommend that you, for example, for Llama, this is uh, this is the closest prompt to the prompt you need to create because it has one uh, demonstration. Um, start with this and then think about how you will add your training examples to this without actually copy pasting the content of those uh, training examples. So you will need to have some variables that are uh, having as values um, inputs and uh, outputs you want to you you want to uh, show to the model. Um, so start with this and then think about how you will programmatically add those variables into a string. I recommend that you print the resulting string to check that it makes sense that it looks like something you would actually give to the model. Um, all right, any questions about that? All right, so um, before we move to our next topic, I will just want to give a quick recap of uh, free text explanations or chain of thoughts. So first of all, the term terminology is um, all over the place. A uh, couple of years back, maybe like five, six years ago, we introduced terms such as natural language explanations or textual explanations. Then we, for a while we had free form explanations, then free text explanations had emerged. And then uh, with chain of thoughts, a new term had emerged. So all of these things are more or less the same, or I think about them as uh, same. The reason why natural language and textual uh, explanations were omitted uh, from, or why they were kind of rebranded was because um, today we will see another type of explanations where we highlight input text. So some researchers refer to those as natural language or textual explanations because you're still working with text to explain something, but they are quite different from these free text explanations where you're explaining something in free form. Free form, free text, it doesn't really matter. I think free text um, is more uh, clear on the fact that we are working with text uh, as um, form maybe isn't. Um, the way we generate, create this uh, this uh, free text explanation is by prompting a model like you are doing in your homework, or or we said, okay, maybe your model is not designed to, to generate reasoning about some specialized task you have, but you actually have human written explanations for that task. So you can use a sequence to sequence approach to fine tune your model to generate those explanations together with the prediction label jointly. I emphasize word here jointly because it's really important that the same model is doing both of these. If you are having a model that is a make, that makes predictions and then you train a whole other model to explain why that might be a prediction, then uh, because these are completely two separate models, the question of unfaithfulness becomes uh, even more worrisome, right? There is no reason to expect that the model had used the same reasoning as the other model might have um, hypothesized. 
that could be the reason why it does so. Um, all right. Um, in terms of the models, uh, it makes sense to use the latest models such as Flint 5 Llama 2, IDEFIX, uh, models that have been instruction fine tuned to, to generate these kinds of reasoning. It, there is a better chance that you will get something more reasonable with them. And also, they are kind of state of the art models in terms of their abilities to predict something. So uh, you are less likely to run in a situation that Ron described where you have less performing uh, model um, that you use just because it can explain. Basically, these models can are kind of state of the art in terms of predicting, but also explaining. Uh, in terms of evaluation, we said, okay, we have a plausibility. If plausibility is just some kind of human subjective assessment of whether the explanation justifies the prediction. And uh, for that, we would go on crowdsourcing platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk and ask a group of annotators, hey, what do you think does this seem reasonable as justification to this uh, answer? I started to show you how you could go about this crowdsourcing experiments. Um, I will leave that for, we will have a session in, uh, I think October or November, where I will show you kind of how to go about doing human evaluation. So I will uh, demo how to how to use uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk then, because I'm kind of behind on time. So I wanna move forward to other topics. Uh, we have also seen uh, in one of the presentations uh, that uh, we can also, plausibility is kind of, this overall judgment of acceptability of the explanation, it's kind of, um, you know, I can maybe focus on factuality, you might focus on style, it's very vague, what do we look at when we are giving this plausibility judgment? So it might be better to have this fine-grained um, categories of the uh, generative explanation, such as, is it uh, consistent, coherent, is it Logically, does it make sense? Um, is it informative? Is it fluent? Is it factual? So we could have a different metrics for different aspects of the generated explanation. And last time, uh, one of the suit of metrics for measuring something like this was presented uh, under the name of Roscoe. Roscoe, I think, is better is is designed more when we reason step by step. So and when we have these logical kinds of reasoning. Um, I think when something is too broad, you might not use all of the Roscoe metrics. So they just might not be applicable. Um, and remember that we other former automatic metrics that were produced in NLP, such as blue, blurred, rouge, blue score, they have, it has been reported that their correlation with human judgments of explanation ac acceptability was really low. So that's why we didn't use any automatic metrics, but Roscoe that has been released very recently um, is a little bit better in terms of that correlation. Then we talked about faithfulness in length, and we have seen that if we want to test faithfulness of free text explanations, we don't have a, like a great metric that gives us binary score, faithful or not faithful. And uh, we have seen that what we can do are produce some of these tests that are necessary uh, necessary conditions for uh, a faithful uh, explanation to meet. So the fact that we uh, meet these conditions doesn't yet mean that our explanations are faithful. It just means that they are not, not faithful. Uh, so that's kind of all we can do. And what we are doing with this is uh, basically intervene on generated explanations. We cut them, corrupt them, and then check that the output changes as expected. As is, we have seen in the paper uh, we, have, uh, we have read last time. Uh, there is another paper uh, that kind of goes on a similar lines, just so you are aware of it. And a couple of years back, we did something similar as well. Uh, in terms of utility, how useful these things, um, these explanations are, we didn't see anything yet. And that's because there isn't much to say about this uh, in terms of produced research. Uh, we will touch on this a little bit later when we kind of shift our fo focus from methods to, to usefulness of explanations in terms of their uh, guidance in appropriate uh, reliance. And what we didn't do, how we didn't uh, evaluate, we didn't show few free text explanations. And I said, look at these, these are looking great. We have made it, you know, we are great. Uh, look at these five examples and we will never be doing this. So 
some of these older papers, you know, from maybe like 2015, you will see some of these um, types of explanations, not of the types of free text, but others. And the, the almost the entirety of evaluation is look at these few examples. That's not something we do uh, anymore. We require that there are, uh, there are, that we quantify whatever we are testing about explanations. All right. Um, I want to also make a note on faithfulness. Uh, we have seen uh, our archaeologist showing us a paper about definition of, of uh, faithfulness. And I said, this is a great paper to read. I do want to emphasize a few points about this. Uh, in this paper, they say there is a lack of standard definition. Different works evaluate the methods by introducing this test. And this is something we see a lot with free text explanations. I showed you here uh, you know, uh, three different papers, and all of them use three diff like a suite of different ways of intervening on explanations. So none of them uh, uses the ones that were proposed before and puts them together in a one big suite of, of faithfulness tests. Um, and um, and yeah, it, at the time when this paper was written, it was even hard to find commonalities between them. And then uh, we have seen in one of the presentations that there are at least some of the properties that these uh, faithfulness tests should uh, have that this paper is saying. But when I, I don't want to talk about those necessary properties. I want to emphasize uh, this quote uh, here in the, from their paper, which says, strictly faithful, faithful or not faithful interpretation is a unicorn which will likely never be found. And I think this is really, really true. Uh, and it's kind of really hard to accept as well, because if we are explaining something, we want some notion of causality. And this is something that's very hard to achieve with the uh, type of models we are working with today. So they say that the reasons for this is because interpretation is approximation of the model and by definition loses uh, information about the model. Um, a mapping between model decisions and human interpretable uh, concepts is lacking. So your model might be doing something and you might be able to even extract this in a causal terms but that might be very hard to interpret to a human or the human interpretation is totally misaligned with what is actually going on. So yeah, I want you to have this in mind that uh, it's good to produce some faithfulness metrics, but it's also, I don't, yeah, try to not get into this mindset where you try to achieve this like 100% faithfulness. I think that will just be um, very hard on you. Um, and yeah, so if we can't have it uh, as a binary variable, then embrace it on a, on a spectrum across models and tasks and across input space. So that's basically what these kinds of uh, papers that we were discussing last time are doing. They are not saying I am going to show you a metric that tells you whether your explanation is faithful or not. They are very explicit in that, that they are what kind of tests they are producing. And um, it is important to show it across models and tasks, as we have seen, because for some tasks, your explanation was faithful, and for some other tasks, it was completely unfaithful and under those metrics. So if you, if you evaluate for one task, and then you say, I produced an explainability method that produces faithful explanations, but your evaluation included only one data set, then you are in trouble, because we know that we might get different situations with different tasks. And... Uh, models. Okay, uh, any questions about any of this? What I said before, not what's on the slide. Okay, so then we are ready to move on to our next uh, explainability method, which will be all about which part of the input led to a prediction. So remember when we talked about free text explanation, we were also trying to answer why is this input assigned this answer, but we were answering this question by showing uh, reasoning in plain English. Now we are going to use another way to approach this same question, same question, and that's going to be by showing which parts of the input are responsible for this prediction. So this uh, this kinds of methods come with many different names. Uh, again, just like with free text explanation, I will be using term highlighting. So highlighting um, other terms are saliency maps or salient sensitivity maps if we work with images. 
Um, very common is input attribution or input feature attribution. I like that term too. You will find input feature important, relevance, contribution, and extractive rationale. So all of these likely are referring to the exact same thing. Um, and highlighting um, are just a family of methods that uh, highlight input features. And those features could be pixels if we work with images or tokens, word tokens if we work with uh, text and that were important for a model prediction. Uh, the reason why I like to use the term highlighting uh, basically comes from the, this paper uh, as well from Alvin Yakovi. And basically the gist of the argument is that it is the one that suggests the least amount of, this is how a human uh, would reason about it. Uh, so this distinction is important because uh, some of these, these methods are not trying to emulate human-like uh, way of solving tasks, unlike free text explanations. These are going to be uh, either post hoc or they are going to be part of the model uh, inherently, but there will never be, if, it, if they are part of the model inherently, often they will be trained without human-written uh, highlights. Um, so yeah, it's just to signal that Rationale signals human-like reasoning and highlighting suggests that it's very kind of objective. You are just highlighting inputs. So in general, highlighting techniques compute the relative importance of each feature. For example, word in the input relative to all the other words in the input. And importance is defined very loosely. And you can kind of think about it that a word is going to be important. If I remove it from the input, the model's prediction would change a lot. If the word was not important, then removing it from the input likely would have no effects on the model prediction. Uh, and let me show you a few examples. So this, uh, this is a task of mask language modeling that now we know what it is. Uh, we put some mask token in a place of the original word, and we need to predict what was the original word. And this model, I don't remember which model exactly this was, it predicted uh, the word his with the highest, uh, highest score. Uh, and then uh, we can kind of uh, go about showing which words, other words in the input were important for the model to think that in, uh, in place of mask here, we should have word his. And the words that were highlighted, two most important words uh, for predicting his in place of mask are doctor and uh, patient. And this can be kind of suggestive that, okay, the, this model is having a um, correlation between the profession doctor and uh, male gender because the pronoun his was used here. So it can give you some insights about the model. Another example here is of a sentence where for which we need to predict the sentiment. Sentence says a very well-made, funny and entertaining picture. Uh, the model is very confident that the model has a positive sentiment. And then if we visualize top five words, we get uh, this kind of situation, which is a little bit less clear than the situation we had before. So entertaining, sure, I agree, it's a positive word, but then you likely uh, are thinking that words funny and well or well-made are more important than um, this dash here and the, and the comma, comma here and the period at the end. So uh, at some point we will see that uh, punctuation is really important for some of these methods or punctuation signs turn out to be highlighted a lot by the, um, these gradient-based methods or attention-based methods. And sometimes this could be just uh, due to the fault of how the method was, um, was um, yeah, implemented. Uh, we will see that with the attention-based uh, explanations. All right, and for images, we highlight pixels. Next time, uh, some of you will present this work in more detail. Here, I just wanna show how a highlight of an image uh, would look like. So the, wherever we see red, more red, that's where the pixel was uh, more important, and wherever is lighter, those are unimportant pixels. Okay, any question of like just high level what highlighting if is before we go into an actual method of computing with these kinds of highlights? Okay, so um, one, one uh, 
one of the most prominent techniques for um, doing highlighting uh, uses gradients uh, with respect to our input, um, whatever our input objects are. For us, those are, let's say, vectors of words. And we are going to estimate the importance of a feature using derivative of the output with respect to that feature. And we have already talked about this when I think was showing you this in the intro uh, uh, session of this course. But the idea behind why we would do this is because derivative by definition tells us how much the function will change if we change the input variable slightly. That's literally definition of a derivative. So here, uh, we have output function. Uh, if we take the derivative with respect to output function, then we are exactly measuring how much our slight changes of input variables will have, um, how, how much the output variable would change uh, with those small changes. Um, we can illustrate this. So imagine we have a very toy task, which has only two input features, x1 and x2. Imagine we have the uh, two classes that are here illustrated with red and blue. And uh, imagine that if you are in this region of feature space, um, for these values of x1 and x2, you would predict the first class depicted with red. And if you are in this region, you would predict uh, blue. A classifier that behave something like this as a good classifier for this uh, situation. And imagine you are in this spot here. Now, if we compute the gradient of, um, of uh, what is the output function here is the probability of the, of the class. Um, with respect to our inputs, it will tell us that if we move in this direction, we will going to change our output variable the most. So if we choose, choose to choose in this direction, we will be in the region where uh, from small probability for the blues class, we will get very high probability for the blue uh, class. If we, if we move uh, in these directions, nothing would change, right? The, the, the color here is very similar, meaning there would be no change in the output uh, variable. Uh, if we move in this direction, eventually we will get into this red blob, but here we need to choose ch uh, kind of move less to get to the big blue uh, blob. So if we move in this direction is the direction where we will uh, where we will um, have the highest uh, change uh, in the uh, in the output. So uh, changing this feature x1, is very important because it is uh, determining this direction going to the right. And feature X2 is less important because moving up or down doesn't do much for our output variable. So if we are in this exact spot, X1 is an important feature, X2 is not an important feature. And that can be uh, measured by the gradient. Okay, so this just says we are going to, we compute the gradients and then we just, uh, that's going to be our uh, score. And then we, um, with some normalization because we are getting a vector and then we will plot it. So yeah, we need to see more details to understand this last sentence. Okay, so let's talk about how we are gonna do this exactly. Is it clear why we want to do calculate gradients? The, the illustration made sense. Okay, great. So uh, now we are going to try to derive what uh, exact scores. So for each uh, token, we want to have scores. So let me let me describe what I draw here. It's one of the common examples I keep showing up. So we'll have some input. Uh, it's going to start with a CLS token because I decided to use some encoder-based uh, model. Each one of these tokens is going to be represented by a vector that will be, let's say, 768 uh, dimensional. So each token first is represented by a vector in a transformer. It goes into a transformer encoders, and the output of the um, kind of uh, second to last layer in transformer is going to be uh, the final representation of each one of these tokens. And then we said, uh, okay, if we are doing a classification task, and as always, I am imagining we are doing binary classification, 
we said we are going to use the representation of the CLS token, multiply it by output matrix, which has two columns because we have two classes. We are going to get a vector of two. This is going to be our logit vectors. And we are going to uh, squash the values in this logit vector to values between zero and one uh, using softmax. Um, this is our standard procedure, right? Now, I said we want to use uh, we, we, our goal is to compute some kind of gradient, but it's kind of, I think, unclear with respect to which function and with respect to which variable. So function of, if we are going to calculate gradients in general, gradient takes function that goes from a uh, high dimensional space to, um, to a scalar. And then the gradient of this function is going to go from RD to RD. So this is like something you, you learned in, I suppose, Calc 1. This is important that it goes into a scalar value. So now we are thinking we are interested in some function of our out, output. And this function has to give us a scalar value. Right now, we have a two-dimensional vector. So what kind of things we could use here? Um, remember, the goal is to measure how the output would change. So maybe, and we want to explain the predicted label. So the first option could be to use, um, I will write function one of X could be, we could use um, the max of, our logit vectors, right? Or very similarly, we could use the max of our softmax uh, vector. Why we want to do that? We know that we are going to take the argmax of these vectors to be our predicted label. And if we are interested, which input features are going to are responsible for making a certain prediction? then finding input features that would change prediction makes sense as a, as a function. Is that clear? Okay. Um, however, what kind of, um, both of these are used in the literature. You will see both of these variants. Uh, the third variant that is very common is slightly different. Um, imagine that we had predicted first class here. So our class um, YP is argmax of VP. And imagine we have predicted the first class. I'm using zero, zero notation. Then we are going to use as our function the loss, and this can be cross-entropy loss, between your score for your predicted class, VP. So the, the vector, the softmax vector and the uh, vector where we will have one where the predicted class is. So you're basically computing the loss, but you are pretending that the gold class is your predicted class. And this is just to uh, have a attribution that is focused on the predicted class rather than the gold truth label. If we had used here loss with respect to the gold label, then we would look for inputs that are that would um, explain how you would need to change inputs to get the gold label. But that's not what we are interested in. We are trying to explain the predicted label. So these are three very common options. And I will just repeat, the idea be behind uh, gradients is to uh, measure importance by saying how much a little change in our inputs would result in the change of the outputs. Uh, outputs being here, these, uh, these three possible functions, one of them. Um, so all of these make sense as a, as a choice because all of them are related to our predicted uh, class. Let's say we have chosen the third one to be 
our function. Now we are going to calculate gradient with respect to each one of them. But the difficulty here, I mean, not real difficulty, but just the detail to have in mind is that we don't have a single representation uh, of, uh, of our whole sequence. Rather, we have each, uh, we have a vector for each token and each one of them is high dimensional. So what we are calculating is the gradient of this function with respect to each one of these vectors. Um, so we are going to go from, we go from here and we back propagate all the way back to uh, our inputs. That's how we calculate gradients. So we will have a gradient of F3 of Xi. Xi is the vector, see, I use this notation to represent each one of these vectors. That's going to be by definition of a gradient, a vector of partial derivatives. Um, so we'll have partial derivative of function f with respect to uh, first element in our embedding for the first work. All the way to the partial derivative d. And this is going to be element of Rd, where D is that high dimensional um, number like 768. Okay. So I said we are going to use gradient to tell us how important each token is to our predictor, to, to whatever label was predicted. If you are following me, can you tell me what is a problem right now? So I'm, I'm talking about, I want to important scores and I just got this vector. Yeah. Kind of, kind of. So, um, we have different values and we are talking about important scores, the score of one token. So it's not that they are different as much as that we have D values, but we want a single score, right? Right now we have D values. So we have a vector where we want to have a single scalar number. So what can we do with this? Do you have any ideas? How can we turn this vector into into um, just a scalar. Imagine that all of these values were really high for this uh, token and imagine that all of the values, so this is, I hope it's clear that we will have this many gradients as there are words in the input. So because we have here, uh, this is I corresponds to different tokens. And here we have X1, X2, X3. So imagine a situation where X1 has very high values here in every dimension of the gradient. And imagine that uh, the second token X2 has very low values in each one of the dimensions of the of the um, its gradient. Now I'm asking you how to turn these vectors into a scalars that will kind of tell us that, yeah, first word is really important. The second one is really not important. I'm sure you all have an idea. Yeah, these are all options. So we could, for example, sum. This would give us a, a scalar number, right? Um, the problem with summing is that, okay, if one value was positive, the other was negative, and now they cancel out. Seem seemingly nothing is important when things could be important. Um, so more common options are to use some kind of uh, norm of this vector. So for example, L1 or L2 norms are frequent choices. So, you might have, I will, I will use S to denote the score of the token. 
score for the first one could be uh, F, uh, the, oops, yeah, let me just write this down. It could be, I will write P and then P could be one or two. Uh, it might be something different from one and two, but these are very common choices in general in machine learning, including uh, to kind of squash this vector into a single value. However, uh, a very frequent choice, more frequent choice is to uh, do a dot product between the gradient and the vector itself. And we are going to also uh, add a negative here. So let me explain this. Uh, we know that the scalar product between two vector, these two vectors uh, is a sum that goes from K to D, uh, where we have partial derivatives of D X K I here times uh, the K to dimension in our vector. So if you know anything about linear models, you can kind of think about this as a, as a linear model as well, where each input feature of your token is weighted by its partial derivative with respect to this function. Uh, the reason why we have the negative sign here is because we want to move in this uh, direction where we are going to be uh, moving towards uh, this change. And if we are having negative here, we are moving uh, in that direction. Otherwise we are going uh, away from it. So this is a common choice you will see, the dot product between the gradient, the negative dot, uh, scalar product between the uh, gradient and the uh, vector itself. All right, so what we have achieved now, uh, as I said, we are doing this for each one of these uh, vectors x, uh, i, and imagine we had n tokens uh, um, in our input sequence. In this example, we had three, so n equals three to this example. Uh, let's say we have vector of s, which where we put um, x, x1 all the way to x n. So this is, uh, this is a, a sequence of scores for each one of the tokens. And now uh, if we use some kind of heat map, for example, we could uh, plot these and then tokens that had higher score will have higher value, higher like brighter value in these uh, heat maps. So you would just plot uh, this kind of uh, array of scores together with your uh, corresponding tokens. However, there is one more thing we need to do. Uh, I said we are calculating the relative importance of each token with respect to all other tokens. So what else should we do here? Any ideas? So the last thing we are going to do is normalize this um, each one of these values with respect to the norm of this sequence. So um, the norm of, I'm talking about this norm, and let's say we are going to use one norm. So if we have one norm of this sequence is just the sum of absolute value for all the scores. So now we are saying uh, that this score here, um, is um, this token, first token is, um, this much more important than all of the tokens uh, in the input by doing this normalization. And that's finally it. There is no, no more normalizations. Um, so yeah, although idea is very simple and I think very intuitive since we are very, very familiar with the derivatives, the actual, you know, when you start implementing it, there are few levels of details to have in mind. So let's go over everything once more. We had a classification setup here. So we didn't have text generation, which would be way more difficult. We have just one, uh, one label at the end. And uh, for the choice of our function, we could have chosen at least three things here. Maybe there are even more, but these three are very frequent. And just because other people mostly use option number three, we decided to use it as well. Uh, once we have our function, 
we need to calculate our gradients, right? It's important to realize that function goes from d dimensional space to, to a scalar value. And here we have as our input, a sequence of d dimensional vectors. So it's not like we are giving to our uh, function the whole sequence. We are pretending as, we are, as if we are giving only one uh, token. And then we will get the gradient will be with respect to each one of the tokens. Uh, here, we have used the definition of a gradient. This is nothing new. And when we realize, ah, bummer, we have the dimensional vector of scores, whereas we want one score to be plotted in our heat map. So we need to squash this uh, vector into a scalar value. And we could use you know, LP norm, pretty standard. We could use some, some has these problems with canceling. So you will see it as well in papers, but then it kind of, I think it became recognized that it can be problematic. And very often we will see a dot product between the gradient itself and the, uh, and the input token vector. Um, and then the final thing we need to do is do this normalization. So turn these absolute scores. This is how much this token is important in isolation with respect to changing it to a relative score with respect to all the scores of all the other tokens uh, in, the, in the input. Okay, um, so that's how this works. So I'm sure you have some questions about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, let me see. I think I might have it on the slide here. Okay, so. Okay, so you want to move the further and further less Yeah, exactly. So we have chose this third option uh, for the uh, for what to use as an uh, as the output. It's the it's the loss between our um, probability of the predicted label and and the predicted label being gold true true label. And uh, by using the uh, negative sign, that gives us direction uh direction where we would need to move to have smaller smaller loss so these are features this is where this this is a direction of the features where we would have even smaller loss for uh where where we are trying to predict the predicted label which is a little bit mind bending that we are now having loss with respect to the predicted label Yeah, so basically this whole slide kind of tells everything I tried to say when I went back through this whole procedure. So you have, uh, when you are using gradients uh, for tokens, NLP tokens, then you have a different, uh, different uh, things to consider. What are you going to use as the output function you are going to you know, calculate gradients for? Um, how are you going to turn the uh, gradient with respect to embedding into a scalar score? Uh, we have said, okay, dot product with embedding itself is, is a pretty good and standard choice. And then uh, in the end, we said, okay, do we normalize values? We said we want to normalize them because we are measuring relative importance. So we L1 normalize across all tokens scores. So you need all of these uh, steps. Um, if we are using images instead of tokens, uh, the situation would be almost the same with um, images. We would have uh, different channels, so RGB for red, green, and blue. Um, and then we would back propagate to the vector representation of an image for each one of these channels. We would get three scores as we got these scores for each token. And then we would do something similar to squash it in a singular score. And uh, basically that's it. That said, uh, now this, what I just said is was more specific to type of vision models that preceded transformers. Now we have these patches, and each patch is a is a token, uh, like a token in uh, in a text. So you could do everything the same, and then um, you know back propagate back to the each uh, each pixel in each patch. Um, one of the students in this class did that last year, and uh, I think that one of the problems that 
uh, occurs is when you try to you get highlights for each individual batch and you're like okay to get the highlight of the entire image i'm going to just recombine the highlights of each batches individually but then on the edges of the each patch we have got certain highlights that seemed uh very um yeah they didn't seem to be necessary so basically if we had the three by three grid on the grid we got highlights so that seemed very strange so I'm not sure, but maybe the way we need to recombine highlights of individual patches back to the highlight of the entire uh, image requires a little bit uh, more attention to details. And I tried to look at some of the recent implementation of this, but I didn't find anything super, yeah, super, super clear on how how people go about this. But just have have this in mind that things have changed in vision with vision transformers. Okay, um, questions before we move forward? Right, so here is one example from uh, sentiment for sentiment classification task. Here we have a sometimes tedious film. Uh, the movie is predicting this is actually a positive sentiment. And if you are doing some of uh, this kind of attribution and highlighting, you will get uh, these scores for each one of these, uh, each one of these, uh, Tokens. So here we get that tedious has really high score and it has a negative score. So what this tells us that tedious has high power to change this uh, prediction from positive to negative because uh, the, the score here is negative. It is um, the, the, the high magnitude cor corresponding to this word is leading it to move in a direction opposite of the predicted label. So um, that's how we interpret this number. Here, point two, sometimes this says, okay, this has, um, this is why, this is, uh, this word has, uh, is important to push the model toward predicting positive label, which I think makes sense because if we didn't have this word, uh, and if the review was only a tedious uh, film, then more likely it would be that this will be predicted to be a negative movie review rather than positive. So the fact that this is an important word and it's important for predicting positive label makes sense. Yep. If this word is like the yeah, so you need to consider the fact that there is a negative sign here. So um, it says, the, the way I interpret this is that if you, if you have a negative score here, it is a word that is important to move the prediction from positive here, predicted label to opposite class, which is uh, negative. So it speaks more for, um, and remember the gradient measure how much changing each one of these words would change the prediction so the fact that the gradient magnitude is high here makes sense because changing this word a lot would uh, changing this word even a little bit would change the output a lot because uh, then we would uh, get something else yeah so yeah both the magnitude and the and the direction is important here and that's why i think um, is another reason why people like the dot product because it preserves the this sign, unlike uh, the LP norm where all the scores would be positive. So you wouldn't get this um, extra layer of interpretation where you are like, okay, this is where it was, is kind of important to predict this label or the opposite label. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about problems with uh, uh, using gradients. So um, gradients are local. They are function of the, of the uh, input. So for a given input, you get gradients. So they are very sensitive to noise. If you, this illustration here tells us, okay, we added some Gaussian noise to this. And now imagine that each one of these little green dots um, is, uh, kind of causing the model to think that there where this great little dot is, is uh, where it would change the output uh, a lot if it goes to that little dot. So um, so if we, if we calculate gradients here, 
all of these directions become kind of possible because if we move in any of these directions, we hit one of these a little, little gray blobs. So they are very sensitive to slight perturbations. Uh, another problem is that saturated outputs lead to unintuitive degradants. So here is a little toy examples of where you have, um, again, just two features, X1 and X2. And the solution to this problem was uh, function X1 plus X2, which uh, is an identity function up to the sum of these two features being one, and then it becomes one uh, re uh, regardless of, of the sum. So here, uh, if you are in this spot, let's say, and uh, you keep one feature to fixed uh, and move the other feature all the way to, to lower than one, then the gradient becomes, um, becomes uh, zero. So seemingly these two features are not important, but we do know that they are important because uh, we, we do see that the function changes with respect to what these two things are. So not, not great for us. Okay, um, then the third problem is discontinued gradients. Uh, so if you have uh, functions, output functions that look like this, uh, like our rel function uh, looks like, then the gradient will be a step function. So. If you are just slightly slightly before uh, this uh, this value, you are going to get the gradient of zero. And if you are slightly you know above this value, you will get a gradient of one. So just a small change in the input results in a huge change in a gradient. So uh, you know um, if 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 uh, you have here value ten point one, and that now says that oh that feature is super important, but and if you had uh, 9.9, .9. no, no, that feature is not super important. That's really not uh, into it. So how can we mitigate uh, these issues? Luckily for us, there are some solutions. Uh, and all of these solutions are based on an idea that we do not uh, rely on a single gradient calculation. So we don't calculate uh, gradient only once for the point, but we calculate multiple gradients around its neighborhood and then the uh, the average D gradient. So there are two most prominent versions of this smooth grad and integrated gradients and um, I'll go over these. Uh, there are other approaches to kind of circumvent this problem like RLP, deep lift, gram cam. I won't talk about all of them. I just wanna give you two examples of, of a more solid method. So idea between behind smooth grad is super simple. You just add uh, Gaussian noise uh, around uh, your input, and then you calculate the gradients, uh, and you average average these multiple gradients. So you don't use only one; you use the average of these gradients around your point. Super simple. Um, and then the average should point to to the right direction because most of those will point somewhere around it. A few of them will point somewhere else, but most of them will point in the right direction. An integrated the gradient is um, easy to illustrate, harder to formally introduce. Uh, so here, the idea is that uh, as well, the concept is similar. Instead of calculating one, we are calculating multiple gradients, and we are going to calculate the all the gradients um, on the on some path. So you choose a reference point. Very often, it's zero. From zero to your point, you are going to uh, calculate uh, the gradients and you're going to average them again. And this might give you an idea why it's called integrated because it's the average of the gradients on a path, which is definition of integral. So therefore integrated gradients. And they're not only that, but because it does come with this nice mathematical framework, it has also some nice mathematical properties. Uh, integrated gradients is often, you know, when you read a paper, they will say, okay, there are vanilla gradients and then there are fancier integrated gradients. So we use something better as well. Very often they will be presented as another uh, more better gradient based attribution method you, you are evaluating. Um, the annoying thing about integrated gradients is that the, um, you are going to approx approximate an integral the more points you choose, right? So um, this is all going to work better if you have more things you are averaging. 
uh, but then things get very slow, right? So if you choose thousand points on this path, you need to calculate thousands of these gradients for every single of your evaluation examples. So they are slow and that's very often annoying and a uh, cause for uh, maybe using this only on a sample of evaluation examples. Okay, so let's finish quickly a bit just with the summary of gradient-based highlights. Positives, they are fast to compute. Compute, you just do a single pass of a backward function and everything we use, any kind of library has a backward function. So you don't need to implement it yourself. You just get the outputs uh, out of uh, PyTorch uh, backward uh, function. They are visually appealing because, you know, I have shown you those little highlights. It kind of, uh, it's nice to look at this and importance makes kind of, uh, of a sense as to why it could be an explanation of uh, the prediction. Um, the negatives are that we do need the white box access to the model, which means that we have access to the internals. So you can't do something like this with ChatGPT because you can't, don't have access to, you can't do backward paths with the ChatGPT. Uh, gradients can be uh, unintuitive as we have seen with saturated and uh, through thresholded values. So they are don't, they don't come with prob without problems. It's not like they are always going to work smoothly. They are very difficult to apply to non-classification tasks. Uh, so if we had text generation, that would mean that for every generated token, we are calculating the input attribution and going back to it, which is possible. Like everything you are changing is for every token you are doing the gradient attribution, but then everything gets again, more complex in terms of computation. Uh, they ignore the interaction between words and pixels. So not good is not gonna be captured by this uh, kind of a method. And highlighting cannot do anything for you if your model is using uh, knowledge such as common sense that is not explicitly cited in the input. So. With free text explanations, we have seen that we can spell out very, um, you know, uh, reasoning that goes beyond what is exactly in the input. We highlighting all you can do is highlight the inputs, but your model during pre-training had maybe acquired some, you know, understanding of common sense and word knowledge, and you will never get that through highlighting. So it's limited by uh, by design. Okay, so that's it. This is where we stop. Thanks for uh, sticking around for three more minutes. And next time I'll talk about how to go about evaluating these uh, methods. Hi. Yeah, you are one of the lucky ones. Yeah, so you have to do it.